Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Dave Morgan, CEO. I am a passenger. So not a debate on this one, but I, we have, a, have several panelists here. And we're going to jump right into it. I hope everybody had a great time at the lunch. I hope it was fast enough. Some people were a little con questioning and concerned about the buzzer. They didn't know it would be real, and we were really going to use it. Um, there's not going to be a buzzer here until the end of the 45 minutes. So we're going to talk about closing the loop on TV. Um, joining me to my immediate left is Mark Green. Mark. Um, Previously, many years at Nielsen, and most recently had been the head of global measurement science. We have Laura Bernard, the executive vice president of marketing at Fox Broadcasting. And we have Joe Germscheid, who is the, I get the, the title exactly, the director of consumer engagement, I don't want to just say media or buying, at Carmichael Lynch in Minneapolis. And we're going to talk about closing the loop on TV. Now, I just want to give a little bit of a setup. Uh, we've had a lot of, there's a lot of, framework and how we've thought about things from traditional marketing. So you have brand for intent, media you think about print and TV and radio, messaging, emotional, measurement, reach and frequency. We have this other silo that's been digital marketing where the intent has been focused on action. We look, you know, the kinds of media we use are search, display, video, mobile, social. The messaging tends to be promotional and the measurement has been cost per action. We want to talk a little bit about in closing the loop on TV, marketing in a digital age. And you can think about it a little differently. You can think about brand and engagement, an audience-defined mix, messaging that's relevant, and specifically for today, measurement that's closed loop. And so I'm going to turn this over to Mark to talk about some research that we did together, and he's going to set it up and give you the methodology and walk you through it. Sure. Thank you, Dave. So um, let's see if we get this clicker right. There we go. So what uh, Dave asked uh, me to come in and do and work with his company to do a uh, proof of concept around closed loop. And uh, what we did was we took a look at the tune-in business uh, in television. And so we ended up uh, looking at all television promotion campaigns that were run. And it was as published by Kantar in February, March 2014. We uh, included all the broadcast data that, uh, and cable networks. Um, and we analyzed over a million households uh, set-top box data, and, uh, and then we checked it against Nielsen for uh, calibration purposes. So that's basically the framework of what we looked at, and so that's just to kind of tee things up. And what's particularly interesting, oh, there we go, is to find out what matters. And so when we looked at what matters, we did this uh, analysis, and it was really refreshing to see that you know, folks, you've probably been here year on, year out, uh, and you come in, you hear all these newfangled messages, and it's nice to see that some messages resonate over time, OK? And so reach matters most. I got to tell you, you know, I'm listening to a lot of conversation around automation, but as you think about automation in terms of audiences, reach matters, OK? And you got to keep that in mind as you move forward, OK? What we also found is that dispersion across day parts, I, I know that historically day parts is a big uh, way to package television, historically a great way to talk about pricing on television, et cetera. Well, you know what? Dispersion across day parts works best, okay? Um, and, uh, and dispersion across networks delivers the best results. So, you know, this is not necessarily the way the promotion business works, but it's what the data shows, okay? And so that was interesting. What's particularly interesting, getting back to this reach matters business, is exposures past seven days become less optimal. Exposures past 14 days relative to when you're seeing the, the, the program and the tune in is total waste. Okay? And if you look at frequency, you know, once you get beyond five on the frequency count, it's waste. All right? And so these are just some things to kind of reflect on relative to kind of the big findings that we're kind of drilling in. And I'm just walking through some high level here. Um, and so the day parts, if you look at the day parts and you see which are the strongest, late fringe was the strongest in this particular analysis. I'm not claiming that that's the case across the board, but it was really interesting. And weekday day was also second strongest early fringe prime, they trail, okay? Think about the money that you spend there and how you can kind of convert that money back. And then we took a look at reach and going off network. We took a look at ad exposures on network. We took a look at ad exposures off network. 
Uh, we took a look at the influence of the different campaigns had, um, and we looked at it in aggregate across the networks just to kind of summarize and show some high-level results. Obviously, Dave will decide you know, how to disperse the information later, probably talk about that some other time. And so what you find is that ABC is doing pretty good. Uh, CBS, a little bit of struggle relative to the competition. Uh, NBC, same thing. Uh, Fox is uh, working very hard with a lot less exposures, okay, and TBS as well. And so when you look at the off network, you end up seeing also some opportunity there as well. And um, when you kind of drill into it, we did some statistics around spots and we did some statistics around campaign effectiveness. And when you take a look at it and we indexed it, so it's all relative to how the industry is uh, actively playing. It's not necessarily the optimal opportunity, okay? And if you look at that, we ended up seeing that uh, uh, ABC needs some tweaks in the spot area. The use of spots is not as effective, but across the campaigns are doing pretty well. Um, it looks like the uh, NBC has a, a, a great opportunity, both in terms of uh, organizing their campaigns and organizing their spots and thinking about their spots a little bit differently. Um, uh, Fox is doing very well with uh, the spots that they have. Uh, they are in a different situation where you're looking at somebody like TBS where they're running 24 hours around the clock. Fox has much less day parts to disperse across than, say, ABC, CBS, NBC. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of apples and oranges there, but we put this up just to kind of create a little bit of fun for the audience to look at some numbers and ask questions about drill down later. Okay, and then we put them into some kind of graphs to kind of give you a sense of it. And very clearly these graphs is just to kind of illustrate some points. So each one of these dots is a campaign. We took a look at some of the campaigns to spread them out here. Uh, and you can see very clearly as, uh, as you go towards more networks and going off network with your promotions, you're seeing effectiveness go up, okay? And you can also see that there's a lot of campaigns out there with the same number of spots that are less effective than other campaigns with the same number of spots more effective, okay? And so there's drill downs on why that's the case. The point of this, camp, the point of this uh, PLC is just to kind of put it out there for discussion, okay? Um, and then if you take a look at you know, like I said, these are indexes, right? So if you take a look at some of the real data, and these slides are pretty interesting here, you take a look at quintiles, okay? So quintiles of the viewers of NBC, okay? So these are the heavy, medium, light viewers of NBC, okay? Not across all television, just NBC or CBS. You can see that the exposure is really heavy from a frequency point of view on the higher viewing quintiles. And so there's a lot of opportunity to think about spot mix differently, to think about how you want to target differently, uh, or stay the same. And uh, these are the results. This is what you get, okay? And so that's what I want to tee up. I also want to kind of remember some basics. You know, it was, it was I know uh, Erwin Efron is uh, highlighted in this conference uh, this year, and so just remember the basics, right? He was always about the basics. Identify the program targets, optimizing the campaigns on weekly reach, and leverage the off uh, network opportunities. And I'd say in pro promotion tune in, those would be the basics. Also tossed up for, for just kind of uh, fun, what it might look like if you take closed loop, loop and move it beyond just television and take closed loop into the realm of sales data and, and bring in ROI data and go to the next vertical, okay? And so just a dashboard of what that might look like. Uh, it enable metrics to be visible and trackable, which is the, 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 the first step towards action. If you can't make your metrics visible and trackable, you're gonna have a lot more challenge around action, okay? And then that enables the action and accountability. And so just mock up on a dashboard here, not as fancy as some of the other presentations you saw this morning, but the idea is there. And with that, I wanna hand it back to Dave. Thank you, Mark. So I wanna ask one quick question and then I'm gonna open up to a broader conversation here. Um, because it may have been sort of assumed in the title, when you talk about effectiveness here, you're not talking about effectiveness in reaching a target audience. You're actually talking about effectiveness of the promotion spot or campaign to drive viewership to the promoted show. That's exactly right. So what we did is we ran a bunch of statistics uh, associated with uh, the exposures on uh, all the promotions 
And luckily, you know, you're in, a, you're in an environment in television where actually the response is something that's in the same data set. So it becomes very easy, right? Did they view the program? And so we looked at first time viewers, we looked at repetitive viewers, we looked at it as a whole, and we created a influence score as, a, as associated with that, and that's the response mechanism. Right, and also, um, for this analysis, this only was using national campaign that's data. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah. So the Kantar data is the framework in which our lens, if you will, and the Kantar data that we were looking at is national data. So, you know, eventually, if you get your hands on the data set, you say, where's my promotion campaign? You know, the question you should first look at is, is it in Kantar, right? So, you know, yeah. that, that's the frame that we're looking at. Okay, so, Laurel, congratulations. Um, you have the highest per spot power index of any network in television. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, and apparently being done with constraints and having a limited day part of national, uh, of national schedules between your prime and, and football. Um, so you actually, Laurel only saw this for the first time yesterday, so you've been in this business for a while, um, but not that long because you started very, very young. I'm um, doing doing more with less. Yes. <laughs> um, tell us, what's your first reactions? How, what, do you, what do you think about, about this? Um, well, I, I, you know, I immediately called Dave and I said, Dave, you're not taking into account all my affiliates. It's like we do actually run a few more spots than, than what showed up there. But it's true, there's, it's very difficult to measure and it's different on a market by market basis. And so we have had to sort of, um, develop our strategies around what we know we control and what we know we have access to across our synergy networks. So of course, I was like doing the math in my head and I was like, really, really, is that how it all you know, lines up? But it does, it does really make sense when you look at it. And to me, it, it quickly illuminates the thing that we've been talking about a lot lately, which is how to make sure that we are not wasting what we have because, uh, and I'm just talking about in my personal ecosystem, and then we can talk about you know, how we buy and, and everything that we spend money on, but just within our own world, it's like, um, I think we all have this tendency to potentially over-promote the one or two things that are the most important to us, and um, it's very hard to talk people who aren't really immersed in these numbers out of that concept because they just feel like more is going to give you more. And so I'm actually really appreciative when we get into these sorts of things and I can see it because I feel like it's going to give me some fuel to go back to my management and say, let's like take a step back and really look at this and let's, let's decide, you know, and maybe we do have, you know, the be all end all show that needs to get all the, all the promotion in a specific time period. But I think that it opens up the opportunity to give more shows across, you know, the Fox, whole Fox portfolio a chance to, to have more exposure because you don't need to so much fall back on that idea that if I'm not in there, you know, 10 times a day against this one show that I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to achieve my goals. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, you come from a little bit of a different perspective in that you are not a... Uh an entertainment marketer or focusing on program promotion. Um, at Carmichael Lynch, you work with a, a you know, well, tell us a little bit about Carmichael Lynch and, and the kind of clients you work with. Carmichael Lynch is a, is a mid-sized uh, uh, integrated agency, so we have um, everything from public relations to all the creative needs, uh, media planning and placement. Um, we do some CRM work and digital work. It's, a, it's an integrated uh, a shop and an approach. And so, what we're really excited to see with some of the closed loop systems is a lot of different perspectives on data. So we spend time you know, creating four or five spots for a campaign. Um, one of the things that we'd like to take a look at a little more closely is which one of those may be more effective. In the past, we know that there's a cumulative effect, but we don't really know if one was better than the other, if we should tweak one a little bit more uh, other than, than maybe a client's uh, own perspective. So one thing I find interesting, and we had a little conversation, Joe, on this beforehand, but I want to bring Laurel into it, that I hear a lot of talk about the, the coming age of real-time marketing and real-time marketers, and I have to say that some of the only places I've seen them, at least around TV, are the people that market TV, because you wake up every morning with a, a number, <laughs> Unfortunately. And, um, <laughs> and one of the things that's interesting is that, um, 
and I'm just going to bring up creative execution. How many, how many different spots will Fox cut for its, for, for promotion this, this year? Um, another interesting question, because we've been having a big, a big conversation about that internally as well. You know, I think as we're seeing viewership shift um, through a, you know, through a longer tail, and and now we're not just dealing with the people who watch it that night, but you know, three days, seven days, thirty days, and everything else. It's it's an interesting conversation because I think we used to have a very sort of broadcast you know, point of view when it came to our creative. And we would make not as many spots as you think, not like a movie. We would make maybe you know, four or five different sort of directions and then cut them down into varying lengths from there. Uh, still adds up to quite a few spots. Um, but with that feeling of having something in there for everybody at every level, you know? And um, now, because of just the way that people are choosing to watch, we're feeling more and more that we need to we need to craft our message so that it works for a variety of different audiences because we are reaching different audiences at different times and we're not trying to gather everybody to the television at the same time like we used to you know so if you think about it that way TV's everywhere, right? And you have your personal choices of what you want to watch. I watch what I want to watch. You watch. And, and so I'm not necessarily going to watch it just because you're my boyfriend or you're my husband anymore. You know what I mean? I have a lot of other, other ways. So I have to give messages to those people directly. And, and so that's what's changed for us. So while, you know, from a monetary standpoint and everything else, we would love to be cutting less spots, we're being forced to, to really look at it more creatively to make sure that we are delivering the points of any one of our given properties, you know, the right do for all those different demos. Mm -hmm. so, so Mark, when you started digging into this data, um, obviously one of the things that um, I think is obvious to a lot of people here is the capacity to look at a data set like this in this kind of way wasn't possible even a few years ago, um, where you could look at a very granular data set on on actual second by second viewing and be able to calibrate it to Nielsen, because I think it's an important point to highlight there was that this data is calibrated to Nielsen. It's not just a standalone set of set-top box data. What did you find that was unique or different about this data than work that you may have done in the past? And what were a couple of the ahas or surprises? Well, not to get too technical, but uh, at the end of the day, what uh, really uh, surprised me was that we needed immediately to move off of the infrastructure that we planned to have for doing this analysis, and immediately we went into, uh, not to advertise, but uh, AWS, and we ended up uh, putting the data sets there, that's the Amazon Cloud, and, uh, and they were very large data sets. And to be able to go and do that analysis was a... Uh, and I'll put some numbers there. It was moving it from about a 150 terabyte Hadoop cluster to having to go from there into Amazon Web Services just because the flexibility to go this wide, this fast, right. wasn't a normal kind of analysis. And what's amazing is that the first architecture I just described, the 150 byte terabyte Hadoop cluster, that's only like a three-year-old technology that right. is about a thousand times more capacity than typical marketing systems. So that was that was uh, a little disruption to plan, <laughs> but um, you know it, it, one of the things I saw earlier today this, uh, uh, that uh, um, was being talked about is the idea of being agile. And so here we were being very agile, and we were saying to ourselves, you know what, it, it ain't working here. We need to get this job done. So we immediately shifted it over to AWS, and we also the other thing that it, that the cloud was very useful on was scaling the ability to do the analytics. So it's not just about space, it's not just about memory, but it's also about how many machines you have in your cluster to run these analytics, because we were starting to really slow down uh, and we were starting to run these analytics and it was taking 24 hours, which is just ridiculously too long. And so we just would, would rev up the cluster. It was really beautiful the way that worked. And so that was fun. But that was a, a little bit of a surprise for me. I didn't quite realize how big this data was. Yeah. So, uh, so Laurel, one of the things that, I mean, in, for some work we've done, is, isn't that much of a surprise, but it's stark when you look at what are ultimately hundreds of campaigns across every network, was the fact that not only was Prime not the best performing day part just 
for the power to drive audiences to shows. It was actually one of the, the weakest performing. Um, how does that make you, what opportunities do you see as a business person who is using a significant amount of prime inventory for, for promotion? And do you see opportunities to uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that some inventory that may not be as valued that you might have access to may actually be more valuable to you? Yeah, and um, it doesn't surprise me, again, I don't see those numbers that much in our ecosystem because we're not looking yeah. at, you know, a morning news period or a, you know, afternoon block that is um, that's national. You know what I mean? That that mm -hmm. we can also use those to to advertise in. I mean to promote in. But anyway, um, I think we've always felt like that Prime is one of those things where you you know that you've got specific audiences coming to different kind of shows, so they don't necessarily duplicate or translate at the highest levels as some of those other day parts where there's less loyalty, less appointment, you know, so you've got a, more of a scattershot of people in those places, so it makes sense that they're not, you know, I mean, that, that more of them can come over to any one of those primetime shows, but not so many people jump from one primetime show to another primetime mm -hmm. show. Um, but um, the thing that, that... That suggests it's not just about the audience, it's about the content. It's about the content. <laughs> it's about, I think it's about where you are in your day. And, and, you know, I mean, outside of like soaps, which have kind of transitioned into something or, you know, they're dying off or whatever else. But all the rest of that stuff is sort of, you come to it when it's convenient, you know, and Prime was never that way. Prime is starting to become that way because you have options, you know, you have options to catch up, you have options to DVR it and watch it when you feel like it. So I think we're just gonna continue to see this whole world kind of, you know, merge together and it's going to be less, you know, dictated by, uh, by day parts and things like that, but we're not there yet. So right now, I, of course, I mean, and inherently, I know that I do get a lot of, of viewership converting over from, again, from our local affiliates in early fringe and prime access and in late fringe. You know, I, I know that's happening as well. But certainly when we go out to look at what we're gonna buy, um, we are definitely taking all of those different day parts into consideration. And, you know, and then one of the things that I enjoy about working with you guys is that you take it to the next level and you come back and you tell me other places that, well, you don't tell me, but you suggest there are other places <laughs> that I should, be, I should be investing in that are not gonna be intuitive to us but you know the numbers are there, and and I feel like we're the obviously the beneficial type of advertiser to this because we can actually see if it paid off because we know if people turned the channel. I mean, you could see if it pays off if you're able to move more product and you can you know play in the space creatively and see right. what's working, which is exciting. Right, and and your point about the the data and how huge the data is. I mean. Uh, just within the last few years, uh, as, an, as an advertising agency, we're, we're able to get more of that data in from our clients. Um, and there's no way that a mid-sized or even a large agency is gonna have the horsepower or the, uh, the wherewithal to actually crunch those numbers in and, uh, and get something meaningful out of it. And so immediately, too. Right. I mean, the, the, the speed of the data is something that, uh, that's really gonna be a game changer, I think. Um, yeah. so, so Joe, your background and when, when we met um, a number of years ago is very digital. Right. Um, uh, now that you're working in TV and we're talking about, about TV here and you're looking at the kind of measurability you saw on online with TV, what's, what's your first reaction? What did, what, did you, what did you tell me out there in the lobby? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, we've been, we've, we've been able to look at this stuff for years uh, quickly and, and optimize so fast uh, in digital. It's just, it's just logical that we should be able to do it now uh, in television. And here it is, you know, 2014, and we're still not there yet. And it's, it's a little frustrating, uh, to be honest with you, that, that we're not there yet. But we're, we're, we're moving forward. We're, we're getting that way. So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about you know, a, a couple of things that, that uh, can come to light with this kind of information. I mean, um, the age, uh, gender, demographics, um, whereas they are gonna be around forever, uh, they should not be as important as they are. I can't wait for that day. 
Because you know, as an agency, we spend a lot of time and a lot of strategic minds and analysis go into figuring out exactly who our target audience is. And we build it out and we, we build and optimize our creative as much as we can through testing to hit that person that's described a million different ways um, beyond age and sex. And then when we go to the, uh, to the marketplace, that's what we're buying. We have to, we have to, you know, have to dumb it down. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not fair to the, all the work that we've done over the years to, mm -hmm. to, to hone those target audiences. And finally, we've got, we've got a product and we've got something that we can use to, to find that and quantify that and, and keep it in our own currency, which is our own target audience. So really excited about the incremental reach and the things that we can find by using a program like this. Right. Um, now, logically, it's just going to flow that as you're seeing uh, television information and, and, and you're able to, to, to see it in real time or quick, quickly after mm -hmm. it runs, it, logically it flows that we should be able to see the same thing with consumer packaged goods, with QSR, with all kinds of different uh, uh, categories. Yeah. We're really looking forward to that. So, Laurel, before you were in the TV program promotion, world, you were in the, the, the studio, the movie studio and theatrical. So you've seen a version of more real-time marketing, and then you've seen probably a version of a three-year plan. Uh, you know, it's, as I've heard it described, it's more like, it's, you know, marketing a movie is more like a, it's more like a presidential campaign. It's a, a many-year process. Can you give us a little sense on on how you see, on your view as a, as a marketer with that kind of experience, how you see the idea of closing the loop in TV, which in this case, at some point will be, you know, showing a dashboard like that that'll actually be opening weekend sales right. from attributed to TV spots that week. Right, I mean, I, I think that, I think that the entertainment business in a weird way, it's, it, it moves very slow considering how real it is and how vibrant it is for the people who, you know, who utilize it. People who go to film, people who go to TV, they feel like it's a very fast moving business, you know, but I think we're really a pretty traditional business in a lot of ways. And it's taken a long time when, I, I mean, I remember when I was first introduced to the idea of online ticket sales for, for film, and that was 15 years ago. And it's really taken such a long time until that's even gotten to a place where now I feel like the industry is really starting to mark itself by the success metrics there. You know, they're making many more decisions about how they're spending their digital dollars based on, you know, how the box office sales are accruing. So I feel like it's going to be a natural progression for that industry when they start to realize that they can measure similarly. It may not be exactly the same. It may be exactly the same. I mean, pretty soon we're all going to have interactive televisions where we just press a button and buy movie tickets if we want to leave our TVs, right? And, and, and hopefully I bought into that know. vision in 1993, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting. Still waiting. It's coming. It's getting closer. Still waiting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it is interesting, though, because um, I feel like in television, we've been able to have more flexibility to, to pay attention to what we're learning, um, you know, through all of this data and through the, through the closing the loop end of things. But um, I, am gonna, I am gonna counter you a little tiny bit and say that um, I do think that everything that you guys are pulling up and showing that, you know, the last seven days is the most important. Obviously, we've always believed in the immediacy and that the last two or three days and even day of can be the most important time that you message. Um, and that beyond 14 days, you're really starting to see less success. But to me, that just reinforces that I've been spending my less is more um, the right way for all these years on television. Other media, you can't necessarily do that. You can't wait until the last two weeks to get your message out there. You know, you need to, and, and, and television in a strange way, especially with prime time, um, is becoming more theatrical in a lot of ways. You know, if you think about it, theatrical has to brand their movie and make it an event both for the people who come on the opening weekend and for the people who hear about it and come in the second weekend, come in the third weekend, you know, eventually buy it on, on DVD or watch it on, you know, on pay TV. And TV never 
we never looked at it that way. You know, TV was always like, okay, this is gonna happen tonight, and then it's pretty much gonna go away tomorrow, and then maybe if you're lucky, it'll go into syndication or it'll show up as a DVD later on. And now we're having to build a brand that has to, you know, it has to live. It has to live for three days, seven days, 30 days. I mean, we've always had to build a brand with television, but now we have to build a brand and allow the viewership to sort of stretch out and not just expect all this immediacy. So to that end, I do think that we are starting to be more theatrical in the fact that we are starting six months out, eight months out, sometimes a year out with tentpole opportunities, you know? I mean, I think everybody has seen Comic-Con become like this huge event it started off being a huge event for film, and then it became a huge event for television, too, because it's nicely timed two months out before we all launch our fall shows. And, and it's even six months out from shows that are going to launch in January. So it becomes this platform to get those kind of true avid fans to sample your wares early on and hopefully go talk about it and tweet about it and everything that they're supposed to do. And so, it's it, it, sorry, I'm kind of long-winded, but it's great to see. No, this is good. This is good. It's <laughs> great to see that you know that if we use all of our media mix correctly, and if we use the television to do what it was always meant to do, which is to build an event at the at the conclusion of a campaign, at least as far as as entertainment is concerned, it, it, this all really makes a lot of sense, and it it fills in the picture really well. I think, you know, obviously it's different for, you know, the types of clients that have to have an ongoing presence all, you know, all year round or seasonally or whatever it is, but, you know, when you can then deliver that information in an optimizable fashion and you can, you know, keep bringing those learnings in, I see that there's a real, you know, potential benefit. Mark? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I completely agree with the notion that, and it's, it's important to understand, that this is about television promotions, this study. This is not about uh, paper towels, okay? The, the, the dynamic of response may or may not be similar, okay, though I do have some prejudices. But for me, what's beautiful about this whole thing is that it's, it's really the first time for me that I've been personally involved where the whole story gets told by the data instead of gets told by presupposed, packaged, you know, bromides that people think about as, you know, this is the way I always plan, this is the way I do this, this is the way I do that. And now we have a data-driven story. And what's really nice about this data-driven story is when you peel back and look under the hood, not all the programs behave the same. And there's a lot of interesting things in terms of program turnover, first-time first viewing, there's a lot of treasure trove to, to dig through there, and this is just, it's just one vertical. Yeah, well, what I thought was interesting was that uh, it showed that for a portion, a certain amount of audience, that there's a significant group for whom their TV viewing is a movable purchase. That, um, and obviously, one of the things that we probably sliced and we went back to deeper brand building, and at some point we can become holistic, we'll find a really big difference there. I mean, we had a um, it had a conversation before about we're only looking at media effects. We haven't even, you know, we're not even yet looking at creative effects, right. which probably there may be a media effects of a 20% right. difference. The creative effects are probably 100% differences. Uh, Joe, this is one of the things you and I, we talked mm -hmm. a little bit about. How do you all view this as a, as a, as a shop very creatively focused? And I'm going to look more broadly than obviously entertainment, but for retail, QSR, other, other categories. Sure, I mean, we, we um we budget like every other agency would, and we budget for uh, um, a production of, of creative maybe once a year, um, where, whereas it's all gonna roll into that one or two or three uh, executions that we're able to, to, to manufacture. You know, that's what we produce, is that, is that creative. And so if we find out that uh, that, that particular creative execution, um, there's one overperforming in a big way over the other, um, that's going to that's going to direct us yeah. to you know do more like that right. uh, yeah. in, into the into the future and and uh, and hopefully what we'll be able to do is kind of morph that into maybe not as as large of production um, on every single uh, creative spot. We don't throw a million and a half dollars into into a spot. We we hold that back and 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 have some uh, something to optimize toward, you know, something to uh, make a different version of. 
Um, but if we can just, just do one or two uh, optimizations that make a big difference in our, in our uh, yeah. uh, uh, sales figures, I mean, that's, it's going to be amazing. So, Mark, one of the things that strikes me when you look at data in this size is that we now have the capacity to look at the individual spot level and understand a performance. I mean, not at a campaign level, not in a quarterly or a time-based level, but an actual spot, this individual spot that ran on this network at this time to, to do this. Um, now, before your 14 years in Nielsen, at 14 or? 11. 11, okay, 11. You had a number of years in the agency side, 17. too. 17. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to remember all that, get the bios <laughs> perfectly tight. But um, what, is this, what does this say to media mix model approaches, which typically were all gross rating point based, were based on a year's past history, and on, you know, in other words, if you have a world in the future where even TV is measured at the spot level, and then I'm, I'm gonna, you all obviously have an opinion on this, so I'm interested, what do you think as someone who's worked inside and around the media mix models, what happens to that world in those models? Well, so, um, the, uh, little controversial answer here, okay? Just I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, as we move forward in the, the mixed modeling framework, okay, I think what you're gonna find is that some mixed modeling companies are gonna move in the direction of, the direction of working with data closer to real time. Okay, a lot of mixed models tend to have some type of regression framework. So you imagine the models moving from being deep historical regression Correct. gross to relative real-time tactical spot level. I, I see that that Business is- Business objective. Yeah, and I, and, and, I, and I know some people in the game, okay? And, and, and I see that that's very plausible, okay? There's challenges associated yeah. with that, particularly in the PII area, okay? But um, I see that there's, there's definitely uh, some, yep. some ways to move forward there, and I think that that's the future. Yep. And I think what ends up happening is it, it introduces some very interesting questions about what's the role of the mixed modeler company at the advertiser when that happens, okay? When the mixed modeler is essentially your account planner, okay, when you think about it. And so if that becomes the case, how does that speak to the industry structure as a whole? So Joe, does that mean you become a mixed modeler <laughs> before the not. mixed modelers become? <laughs> No, I, just in planners. <laughs> I, I think I think what what really changes is is the the, the client's reliance on it, on on that mixed model as as the go forward, right? As the end all, because in the past, if you've had a client, and, and you know our client mix has been on, ranges from very large automotive to um, to small uh, uh, beef jerky. <laughs> I mean, it goes, it, it runs the gamut. And so not all of our clients are gonna be able to afford mixed model uh, options, but the ones that do, um, this just makes a logical movement towards more real-time data. Yep. And so if, if you get a CEO or a CMO that understands you know, the, the, the fluctuations in the marketplace and things happen uh, that can't be accounted for in those regression models, um, this is a much more secure way of, uh, of And if I could just jump back in yeah. for a second, and I think, you know, it gets back to what Tim was saying, kind of this art-science balance, right. right? And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to need somebody that has that art sensibility, but you're going to need that partnership on the science side, and I think the science side is on the, on the you know, upward swing right now, mm -hmm. okay? But at the end of the day, you end up with balance. Okay, and so what that balance looks like in the future is gonna probably be different than what it looks like today right. because a lot of the potential science is being disguised by art today, okay? And so once you clear that, clear that out and you, you, know, you, you very mm -hmm. clearly understand what's data-driven, what's not, okay? And then that partnership becomes, you know, re-solidifies and I think that that's really where things Oral? go. Um, wow. Well, um, it's also interesting. Um, you know, I was going to throw you in the middle of the mixed model thing, but I thought I'd... <laughs> you know, I, we, don't, we don't have a lot of, of choice but yeah. to be aggressive with how we reach our audiences, and we do need to reach them on a lot of different ways because we truly are forced to try and create an event every single night, and, and that's hard to do. Um, what I wanted to say about, you know, sort of 
overall where this is headed and, and with the data and what I think it's going to allow us to do. I, I keep mentioning, because it's so heavy in our industry right now, about having to tackle this, how do you take a system that was built on attracting somebody to come and watch something that night in their living room to making it a, a place where they can watch it whenever they want. But one of the things that I'm really excited about is that when we do have those kind of properties where we still feel like we can make a cultural impact and we can get a lot of people to come, you know, back in the old school way and watch TV, you know, as a family or, or just get so excited about it because it's, you know, it's, it's a big event. Um, I think that what we're, what we're learning now is, is helping us identify the best way to really target in on those people who are going to be sort of that, the sure shot that are gonna come. And as, as we can get as many of them ignited about something, and then start to add on the other layers of data that are becoming available once we identify who they are and then figure out what else they do when they're not watching TV, it's really going to help us, um, you know, just have such a better scope of where to spend that core amount of money. We're always going to have to spend some of that fringe amount of money, but if we can really, you know, dig in more, and when I say core, I'm talking about like 20 million people. I mean, it's not like it's not like it's you know a handful. Yeah, core, core is not 2,230. <laughs> no, no. But you would be amazed the difference when you're trying to reach the right 20 million people versus trying to reach you know 300 million people. It's a whole it's a whole different thing. Yes. So we're going to open it up. We have four minutes left to a couple questions. Um, so people could put their hands up, and there's a, a runner. We'll get a mic to you, and. Um, while we're waiting for the first question, I am going to tell you, because this came up when Mark mentioned the beginning, um, these are some of the top level findings. We are actually going to make the entire database available um, publicly. We're going to be turning that over uh, to the ARF. We're going to be turning it over to all the TV networks. We think that sort of having a future of more granular findings and actual effectiveness is going to be useful. And as was also suggested, this is only the first of what are going to be multiple sets of these where we're going to use um, in a personally, in a privacy safe way, we're going to be doing quick service restaurants and retail and insurance and travel and we're actually going to tie it to business objectives or sales effects so that you can start digging in each of these. So do we have any questions for any of the panelists? It's a little post lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I see someone, I see someone, one moving over here to the back, moving faster. Bruce. And when you, and when you ask the question, um, please, uh, if you could identify yourself and then direct it to one of the particular members, please. Uh, yes, uh, Bruce Gerlich. I'm the Chief Research Officer at RedTrack. And hello, a lot of those folks up there I know. I'll address it to uh, Mark. Um, how do you see the fact that there are other companies like RedTrack which have millions and millions of set-top boxes and that are doing this now? Um, in fact, if you look at my blog that just came up there, we did exactly the same thing, um, looking at promos uh, effectiveness, as well as the effectiveness of video on demand. And uh, with set-top box data, you're able to do this um, in real time um, uh, at a very, very granular level. How does that compare to what you're able to do with a limited sample? So, um I would say that we would have had a much harder time doing this, Bruce, uh, if we didn't have a million, a million uh, set-top boxes. So we'd have a, a great deal yeah. of challenge. That, uh, yeah, I would say, say, I, would say yeah. I guess, I, guess yeah. I, I can jump in because yeah. we set the parameters up. We chose to only cut out a million of the 50 plus million people we had because we wanted to go a lot deeper and a lot wider in a lot of things. Um, in a short period of time. I think the most important thing, and you make a good point, Bruce, that Rentrack is doing a lot of work here, Nielsen's doing a lot of work here, Comscore is doing a lot of work here, um, TiVo, TRA are doing a lot of work here. What I think this means, and the fact that we're presenting this here today, is that we're gonna start seeing an area where we've had a very limited visibility into what actually happens um, become very broadly available to a lot of people. And that's why we're going to, rather than just hold it, we're actually gonna publish all of this data and turn the entire database over to everybody so they can even work on it more and doing more. So Bruce, I think what's going to mean is, is we're all moving the band forward and I think we're going to see more empiricism come in to uh, television. And I actually think 
we're actually going to see television grow in power because I think the fact that it hasn't been able to be used on a tactical real-time basis or a short-term basis this way has been one of the things that holds back the, uh, the advertising marketplace. But I'll, I'll just, yeah. the, the larger sample is definitely helpful, Bruce, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we got one right down here. Right, it's right behind you. Tony Jarvis, Olympic Media Consultancy. First of all, thank you so much for sharing this wonderful database. Uh, to your point, um, also using television promotions is a unique opportunity uh, to measure, quote, a level of effect. However, can we take this to the next level? Because if we knew what, say, Fox, ESPN, NBC, ABC were spending in other media around their shows, we might have to recalibrate the effectiveness data because it's very then, to your point, very, very different weight levels and quote, our, love, our wonderful Owen Efron, he always reminds us it's all about reach and you know, maybe short term five, a frequency of five is enough. That's gonna change, possibly change the whole analysis. So. Can we challenge you, thank, in thanking you, can we challenge you to take this to the next level? Um, well, I'll say absolutely. We, uh, we intend to be appending to this a lot of, particularly all of the digital media that's out there that's as sort of accessible and measurable. And I think that by moving it to business objectives and moving it away from just gross rating points, we give a chance that you can actually break the silos down from behind. So we're now out of time. I thank everybody so much for being here. I particularly thank Laurel and Mark and Joe for participating in this. And I will uh, invite you now to the concurrent sessions. Thank you.